It took some time. Once I spoke to my boss and who was telling me those things, it harkened back to things I had learned very young, but you just forget over time because of life and how you move. And so it was that moment where I was like, oh, I can do this. I can speak up for myself. I can be in these rooms and I deserve to be here. I worked hard to be here and I want to continue to be here. Hey there, I'm Annie Dickerson, and I wanted to welcome you to this episode of The Life and Money Show presented by Good Egg Investments. This is the show where we talk about everything from investing to financial freedom to parenting, traveling, creating a life by design, and everything in between. Now, today you've tuned in for a very special episode indeed, because in this conversation, Susan and I sit down with the newest member of the Good Egg team, Ariel Thompson. She's our newest director of investor relations. And in this conversation, you're going to hear not only about her humble upbringing and her beginnings, but also the valuable lessons that she learned very early on in her career that really shaped the trajectory of why she got into finance. Yes, she talks about how she fell in love with finance, something that most people cannot even fathom. She talks about the mystical side of finance. And she talks about what she now loves about investor relations, about talking to investors. And she gets into some of the different things that investors commonly ask about and how she guides them through those questions and concerns. So whether you are new to investing or you're a seasoned investor, we invite you to listen all the way through because this episode is packed with great real life nuggets and tips that you can use right away to get you closer to financial independence or your life by design. Speaking of which, great real estate investments are often a part of how people build toward financial freedom. And if you're interested in investing alongside us here at Good Egg Investments, we'd love to have you join our community. To do so, you can join the Good Egg Investor Club. Just go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest. All right, without further ado, let's dive into our conversation with Ariel Thompson. Ariel, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you guys for having me. We're thrilled to have you here. Now, Ariel, we're going to dive right in because I know you've had a ton of experience in the world of investor relations, but I know also that you had a very pivotal experience very early on in your career at one of the first places that you worked at, a Goldman Sachs big firm. And (laughs) here you were starting out and you had a mentor that gave you some very valuable advice. So tell us about that moment and tell us about how that kind of shaped your trajectory and your journey in investor relations. Yeah. So I started out, I would say my career in investor relations at Goldman Sachs. I'd worked like a year before at Northern Trust, but Goldman was my real introduction. I call it my uh, residency into like learning those skills and really getting like baptism by fire on there, which was super helpful. But Mm -hmm. early in my career, I was, oh, Fresh out of college, I just started my MBA and started at Goldman at the same time. So wonderful thing to do at the same exact time of your life. Lots of work. I wanted to kind of get a good understanding of what I can do to really grow my career and kind of grow myself while I was there. And I had a boss named Ryan Ross. Shout out to you. (laughs) And he would really take the time to talk with me, but really candid talk. So one of the first conversations that we had was about my career. And he remembers this differently than I do. But I remember asking him, what do I need to do to be in your role, in your position? And I was, like I said, 20-something out of college. I was the youngest person on my team at the time and the only Black person on my team. So uh, I knew that that path, especially in finance, which is traditionally, you know, white male dominated, was going to be a difficult one for me. But difficult never scared me. So talking to someone really able to read in between the lines and give me some great advice. And one of the first things he said... Can I just say, before you dive into what he said, was the quality of your life is the quality of the questions that you ask. Mm. And I think to be a young 20-something and to to have the courage to go to your boss and ask that <laughs> question, how do I get to where you are, is not only cuts through the noise, but it tells your 
your boss that here is a woman who's driven, who's ambitious, who has high goals. And then that tells him exactly where you want to go so that he can then tailor his approach and his coaching to help you get to that point. And so I love that you asked that question. I'm going to add that to my arsenal of questions. (laughs) We should all be asking that. And it's like courage or audacity, you know? It's a fine line. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. But in that same vein, he sat down and immediately told, this was like maybe my first couple of weeks there. And he immediately told me in the first three months, you need to learn how to push the buttons. In the next three months, you should learn how to do your job. I should be able to ask you how to do it. And in that full year, you should be able to teach someone how to do it. And if you don't know how to teach someone how to do it, you don't know what you're doing. And that was one of the first things he said. So it gave me such a good path. And so then I came back several times after that, just chatting with him. And I was trying to figure out how to navigate conflict. Right. And the main thing, as I said, I'm afraid that if I speak out or if I say, no, this is wrong, that I'm going to be pegged as like an angry black woman or someone who is that you're not able to work with, difficult to work with. And I said, I'm afraid of that because I know in the past that can follow, especially women in business, women in finance who are assertive. And he said to me, men never think about that. He said, as long as you are communicating in a way that is respectful and that is clear, I will always support you. And that was huge for me. That was like, set me off to the races. And from that point on, I wasn't afraid to meet things head on. I wasn't afraid to be in a difficult position and I wasn't afraid to voice my opinion, but I learned how to listen and how to navigate a conversation. So I was able to be heard amongst my peers or people who were just in higher level positions than I was. So yeah, that was huge. And I carried that with me and and constantly worked on tailoring my response, listening and watching how other people responded based on what he said. He said, men don't think that way. And he would constantly correct me on that and show me and provide examples, which I felt was really helpful to kind of build my career. Wow. That is, I wish I had somebody early on (laughs) to tell me that. That's something I'm still learning now is how different, not just men and women, but all sorts of different people, how they communicate, because I think it's a common trap to fall into to think like, oh, well, my brain works the same as everybody else's brain. Everybody thinks the same way that I do. And if I'm experiencing this, other people must be experiencing this too. Absolutely. And what a valuable lesson to learn at such a young age, early on in your career. And so, okay, so you mentioned that that kind of shaped some of the communication communications within the team. So tell us, okay, was that just a philosophy that you then applied to your work and you were like, okay, this is how men in this field communicate. This is how women communicate. And this is my role. Or did that have ripple effects out into other areas of your life, including communications with investors, your family, your friends? How did that all play out? Yeah, that's a great question. For me, it was not so siloed as to this is how men and women think or the differences as much as it was almost like a lifting of the veil. So going back to what you said of the part about everyone thinks this way, or aren't you that upset about it too? So it was a lot of that, but him kind of reframing that to me and saying, yeah, I'm upset. I'm not going to tell them I'm upset. I'm not going to let them know they got under my skin. And it was kind of that mindset that kind of, oh, that's a little bit different, you know? But that definitely rippled out because of those conversations. And again, when I would go back to him and he would say, no, men don't think like that. You can't, don't say it that way, say it this way. It helped me kind of add to my tool belt for everyone. So I was able to kind of pick up on cues, whether I was talking to someone who I could tell wanted a deep dive or someone who wanted just very short bullet points, you know, just that quick of a change shifted how the response was and if they would reach out to me. And and you would see that in different relationships and things like that, you know, how you were able to communicate to others and also pick up on how your communication is reaching them or not reaching them and how you can kind of shift from there. Yeah. And part of the reason I ask if this bled over into your other relationships is I'm curious, were you brought up with any of these lessons in communication? Were you cognizant of any of these things growing up? Or was this kind of early in your career, you were like, wow, this is something I've never thought of before, something I've never heard about. Tell us a little bit about about your background, about growing up, and what were some of those lessons that you learned growing up around communication? Yeah, I would say that I have always been an empathetic person. 
you know? So I was very moved by, I'm one of those people that would like have my weekend cry because I saw something on, you know, <laughs> Facebook or something that it was like, oh, the puppy, like, please go get the puppy. Can I just <laughs> say, I'm working on that. I have my whole life, I was taught to put my emotions into a box. Yes. And so only now recently am I doing the whole weekend cry, cry at a puppy. And like, I'm like, oh, I do feel those things. Yes. I feel that twinge right here. Is that a thing? Do you like, is it Tuesday and you're like, oh, I have to table that. That's for the weekend. That's yeah. my weekend cry. That's not a Tuesday cry. That's a weekend cry. I've never heard of this. Oh. It's like a little it. post-trauma for me, you know, <laughs> just kind of like, oh, okay. But I too was a person that had to kind of, or that was told, you know, put your emotions to the side and focus on what you need to get done. And a lot of that is, you know, I come from a very strong matriarchal family and my dad's side of the family has deep roots in Louisiana, the South and things like that. So my great grandmother was the head of the family for a very long time. She lived to 103 and she passed away in like 2019. And she lived by herself until 100. And we like forced ourselves in like, come on lady. But she was outside gardening. She was just very active, you know? And so and Louisiana, is this like Cajun, Creole, crawfish kind of? Uh... Not quite. A little okay. bit more. So we're northern Louisiana. So yes, we have like the, it's not Cajun, but we do have the crawfish and we do the do the fish fries. Uh, okay. and we're out on the boat doing like fishing, all types of stuff like that. But it's northern Louisiana, which is Shreveport, um, but oh, even yeah. smaller towns, Bossier City and Benton is mm. where my dad's side of the family was from. I only it's- know Shreveport because I know that it's like an emerging real estate market. Market. It's coming onto the map now. Right. <laughs> There's a lot of land out there and a lot of, you know, you have LSU that's huge in terms of basketball and just sports in general, people out there. So very strong matriarchal family and that kind of, my great grandmother, I was saying, had uh, eight kids, girl, boy, girl, boy, all the way down. Right. Oh, <laughs> so the, <wow>. the, <laughs> she all the way down and they were um, very big on education and taught us from a young age, just even from our elders and our family to, you know, if you want something, go for it, go for it and kind of, and speak up if you want something. And that's kind of harder when you're younger to kind of navigate that. So to circle back to your question, it took some time. Once I spoke to my boss and who was telling me those things, it harkened back to things I had learned very young, but you just forget over time because of life and how you move. And so it was that moment where I was like, oh, I can do this. I can speak up for myself. I can be in these rooms and I deserve to be here. I worked hard to be here and I want to continue to be here. Wow. I can see where the courage started way, way back generations ago to just even be able to be in that room, be able to ask that question took a lot of courage. And I wonder, you know, where did the finance piece come into this story? Because you could have had that courage from your grandmother and passed down through to your parents, your other siblings, that sort of thing. And you could have probably taken that courage into any field, but you chose finance and investing, which is again, a another level of hard and difficulty and to break into, especially as a female, as a Black female in this world. So what about finance drew you? Yeah, yeah, that's another great question. So my family, uh, I'm speaking about my dad's, I haven't even talked about my mother's side, but on my dad's side, they, my, so my great-grandmother worked really hard, right? And she actually picked cotton, which is so like interesting for other people to hear because you think it's so far removed, but it's not, you know, my grandfather who's still alive, my grandmother who's still alive also picked cotton, their siblings. And they would talk to us about stories and how, like my grandfather was like, yeah, I used to get the bad wet so it'd be heavier so I could leave early, you know, <laughs> things like that, which are funny, <laughs> funny now. And if there's a life hack right there. <laughs> I call him Papa. Like, if you knew my Papa, you would just think that's so funny, you know, because you're like, okay. But it's interesting because I say all the time to your comment about courage that I am living my ancestors' wildest dreams right now, you know, because to hear these stories, to grow up with them, to see, like, they all live in the same area. So to see where they lived and to learn and hear and just physically touch the areas that they fought through, you know, I say, 
I am here because of the things that they survived, you know? So with my grandmother and um, my great grandmother and my grandmother, my dad's mom, they worked hard, you know, and they would work extra shifts just to get my dad a little book that he wanted. And he went on to become the first doctor in our family. He's a vascular neurologist. Wow. Went big time. (laughs) Not just like a, you know, like a pediatrician or a family doctor, but vascular, wait, say it again. Vascular neurologist. Neurologist. Holy yes. cow. And he specializes <laughs> in strokes, you know, and went straight from high school to a six year medical program. So he really went for it. And then his other siblings, they one also went into um, medicine. I have a former police officer and a principal, you know, so these were people that took the opportunity to push forward and kind of raise that bar. But there was no one really in finance, you know, and so they understood how to save, you know, and, and were told how to save and these types of things. But that next step was missing. So when I went to school, I initially went to school to be a music engineer, to which my parents said, a producer? No, no. <laughs> no. Try again. <laughs> but then I got into some business classes, fell in love with finance and just to see how much freedom that there was there. Once you were able to kind of learn this mystical, I put mystical in quotes, philosophies that are, unless you take those classes, you're not really learning some of these things that should be available to everyone. And that was huge for me because I saw a path for me to kind of push it one step further and, and bring this information back to my family to kind of, you know, navigate and take us even further. Okay. One thing doesn't compute for me there. And so you went and you studied and then you fell in love with finance. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I'm thinking that most people would be like, how do you fall in love with finance? What is it about? Is it the spreadsheets? Do you really (laughs) like the numbers? Or what was it about finance that really drew you in? That's, yeah, and yeah. the mystical element of finance, <laughs> right? Mystical. Yeah. You just used the word mystical. Let's bring that back too. What? <laughs> so first thing is, I should be clear on that. When I was trying to figure out which major and, and what was interesting to me, finance was interesting because it was different from accounting. Accounting is very much, you look back, it's structured. Finance felt more creative to me in the sense that you're telling a story with the numbers, you're able to connect with people and, and do something with it for the future. And that was exciting to me. I also knew the more I learned about business and finance, no matter what happened in the world, I would be able to find some sort of job, even if I was just a cashier, just having those basic numbers. And that's that survival instinct, you know, just trying to make sure I was doing something that if I can take it to the moon, let's go. But if I don't land there, I will find something. So that gave me a sense of freedom. And that's what made me fall in love with it. So it wasn't necessarily the spreadsheets as much as I knew I could understand various types of businesses. I would be able to understand in different countries, even just basic things. And that kind of opened my eyes to so much. And then to speak to the mystical part, after I started to get into, you know, the investment side, um, I started out in hedge funds, went over in the exchange fund at Goldman, went over to private equity on the investor relations side. It opened my eyes up to, I didn't know anything out of school about the types of accounts people are investing in, what types of funds and properties and all of these things that I was like, wow, they didn't teach us any of this. They just taught us, you know, this kind of cash flow model. (laughs) But in terms of like everything else, there was so much fun to be had, you know, in terms of exploring and being able to really unlock a, a future I didn't know was possible. That's how you know you were in the right field, when you can use finance and fun all in the same sentence. And you are I could tell you're so passionate about it. More power to you. I love that for you. And uh, I love hearing you talk about it because you're bringing it to light in a way that I think most people never get to see because they're so intimidated by the word finance or the word accounting that that's as far as they go. And they're like, oh, that's out of my realm. I don't, I don't, that's not my thing. But you had the courage, again, the courage to go beyond that and say, well, what is this really about? Where is my place in this? How can I see this as part of my path? And you found something that really lights you up, which is fantastic. I also love how I'm hearing a story of 
from a very early age and your generations before saying like, how can I make an impact on the future? How can I make Mm. an impact in my own life? And how can that impact help others around me? Not just this self-serving way. You didn't get into finance to be a billionaire. You got into finance Mm. to tell a story, to like illuminate the path of investing for your family, for the people around you, to be able to pull that out. And that's all in that sphere of like, wanting to make an impact. And I I think that we don't think of finance and the creativity side of finance to be able to serve in that capacity. So many people see finance and investing and they just think like, oh, you must be just trying to make a million dollars or you must be trying to Mm -hmm. live a opulent, wealthy, luxurious lifestyle when really it's the ability to change lives drastically that I'm hearing in really neat ways from your story. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny just to kind of circle back on something you said there because someone asked me a question once on, oh, well, how much money do you want to make? And I was like, as much as I can. Like, the sky's the limit. And they were like, so a million dollars? I'm like, no. A billion dollars? I'm like, why not? And the question was, well, why would you want a billion dollars? And I was like, you're asking me my dream. Why would I put a ceiling on what I'm capable of already, you know? And it wasn't the fact that, again, going back to what you said about the money, it was the fact that so many times people are already dreaming at a cap and already thinking that they can only get so far based on what they've seen, heard, or what was told to them or what they've internalized. There's a lot of psychology around money and um, trauma around money that impacts all of our spending habits and just how we see these things. And so for me, just even breaking that lid off and saying, I'm not thinking about what ceiling I'm going to hit. I'm thinking about how I can free myself and free those around me and spread this to other people because financial literacy is so important. And it's something, like you said, that truly changes people's lives and generations to come. And it can be used for good and for impacting our communities around us, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're coming full circle because take us back to that moment again with your boss early on at Goldman Sachs. Here you are. Early on in your career, you get this great advice. It helps shape your relationships with the people on your team and you're kind of making progress. At that point, I'm curious, what did you want your career trajectory to be and where did you envision yourself going versus the path that you actually ended up taking? Was it the same or was it different to how you ended up where you are now? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. It's interesting because whenever people asked me what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go, I didn't really have an answer. My answer was I knew how I wanted to feel. And I knew I wanted to wake up in the morning and not hate what I do. I knew I wanted to have some sort of impact. I knew I didn't want to go to bed Sunday night thinking about emails. Sunday scaries. Yeah, (laughs) that was huge for me. So it was less of a title and it was more so of, or, or a path and it was more so, I know how I want to feel now. What do I need to do to get to that place? What does that look like? And asking a very specific question of, I used to say, oh, I want to be free. And then I had to ask myself, what does that mean? What does freedom mean to me? And I was like, does freedom mean you don't want to work? And I was like, no, I love working. I love what I do. I love engaging with the community, whether that's investors or just peers, colleagues, whoever. But it was more so I wanted to be at a place where I loved who I worked with. I loved what I was doing. And I was able to kind of take that time and do things outside of work, you know, that fed me and that kept me kind of going. So I hope that answered kind of the question, but it was more so like a path. It was a self journey, you know, how can this not be my entire life, but part of my life that is still very much true to who I am. That's another way to remove the limits. We're all limitless. Why say that you want this title and then this title next? And especially if that's just the historical journey of someone in your career path, instead say like, what's the best way for my life to unfold in this next way? And you're asking yourself value questions to be able to make those steps forward. I imagine that balance was not easy to strike in the world of finance and investing. Was that something that because you had this vision of this is how I want to feel, were you able to kind of maneuver your various roles and and find that balance or has that been a challenge? That was definitely a challenge. It sounds great now to say in retrospect, (laughs) retrospect, but it was absolutely a challenge, especially in 
a high paced high stakes environment, you know, where it was very much dog eat dog. How can I get to the top? Again, with me even starting with the question of how do I get to your role? Then realizing as I was navigating and as I was asking myself those questions that it's not necessarily that I wanted that role. That's what people said I should want. People said I should be happy here because that's where everyone should be, or you're making great money, or you're doing this, that, and the third. And for me, it was, I wanted more than that. You know, I wanted more, more life, you know? And so navigating through that was difficult. It was a lot of trying to explain how I feel to people who just want you to, you know, do the work and provide the outcome. So that took some courage on my side to ask myself the questions and redirect there and really think about who I was engaging with, what kind of company I wanted to be at. And if I was able to find some way to kind of live out through the heart in this world, because I think most of the things we see in in the movies and just past experiences point to the opposite, but there's always a way. It just may not be the easiest way to kind of get through it. Maybe you manifested Good Egg like 10 years ago. When you were doing this work and you just put it out there in the world and then somehow that energy bounced off of Julie and Annie and somehow they found each other and here we all are today. I love that. That's right. Love that. That's right. I want to pull this out for the listener. If you're listening to this and you're in a place where you also aspire to that freedom and that feeling where you don't want to wake up and feel nervous or anxious or stressed about your job, but you're having trouble finding that balance, just know that, I mean, as Ariel has just mentioned, it's a process. Mm-hmm. We're all constantly working on it. You're not alone. That's why we talk about the things we talk about on this podcast, because it's not any one thing that will get you to that balance. It's a conglomeration of a lot of different little things and a lot of different mindset pieces and a lot of little hacks that will get you to that place. And it's going to be different, a different concoction, a different cocktail for everybody to get to that place. And you might be there for a little bit and then you might feel off kilter again. But again, it's it's a process. So Ariel, thank you for sharing that. Um, I feel the same way. I've felt at times where I'm like, oh, I've got it. I've made it. And then something throws me off and I'm like, oh, and now I'm back to all these back-to-back meetings or I don't have time for my kids again. And I have to make another change. So it's a constant shift. But I did want to get into investor relations a little bit because I know that's where your heart is now. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about, you know, you've talked to probably thousands of investors at this point. Give us a few insights. What do you love about those conversations? Maybe what are some horror stories you can share with us? It's okay. (laughs) And You know, what are investors generally, especially these days, what are they talking about? What are they interested in? Yes. I love connecting with people. I love hearing about their stories. I love hearing about their why, you know, why they're doing this, why they're investing, why us. That's always huge. And it helps me understand just how to do my job better. Um, It's a reminder that it's not just cold, hard numbers, that there is a person behind that. And that for a lot of people, this is their hard earned, maybe life's work. And so there's a, there's a care there. There's more than just, oh, they're bothering me, asking me so many questions. It's, it's no, they're, think about the mindset behind that. You know, what is the root of this? Is it, I need to communicate with you more because this is your first time and you just need a little bit more handholding. So talking to various investors, even for those who are savvy, you know, who are bringing in the ultra high net worth folks, a lot of the times they were having, you know, family offices and other people manage their investments. So they would call me and say, I don't know what this is. Can you walk me through it? And that was a great eye opener for me to say, oh, you look like you're so up here and that you, I don't need to tell you anything, you know, but it was a reminder that people are engaged in their finances in different ways. There's still gaps there. There's still the, I'm just going to nod and say yes, because I don't want to look any type of way among my peers, you know? And then just, if anything, it reminded me how close we all are and how similar we all are. Yeah. Uh, People are people. Yeah. We're all people. We're people are people Mm -hmm. and we're all kind of dealing with generally, you know, some of the same anxieties or, or worries and fears about money or the markets. Mm-hmm. What are some of the most commonly asked questions that you've gotten from investors over the years? I'm just curious. <laughs> Besides, where's my distribution? 
<laughs> right? Yeah. I always want to know where the money is, right? Everybody wants to know where the money is. <laughs> always. Well, I did most of my career has been in private placement funds. And in those private placement funds, these ones in particular, they weren't getting shares per se. So a lot of the times it was trying to delineate between what kind of ownership someone was getting in a fund. You know, that was, I feel like that was the most common question because with the private placements and most of the funds were structured, they were essentially loaning the money, right? But they would come back and say, okay, well, how many shares do I have in here? And so it was that kind of understanding the difference between this fund structure and calling capital over time and that you were essentially, you know, loaning us the money. So if something happened, you would be the first to be paid out before shareholders versus kind of a typical, hey, I'm giving you a thousand bucks. How many shares is that going to give me? And how much percentage ownership do I have of the company? So that was a main question that we would get a lot. I'm trying to think about some others other than, you know, distribution, contribution, those amounts. It was also understanding the various types of investment vehicles that there are out there. So most of the time when I would be at some of these bigger firms, they would ask about our funds, but always think they were a hedge fund for some reason. Always. And I don't know why that was. I still think about that sometimes. I'm like, why do they think it's a hedge fund? But um, I think it was because of the demographic of investors we were working with. And so they were used to more traditional, you know, but over time you're seeing just um, more of these, you know, REITs and other structures available to investors that previously they weren't as privy to. So answering a lot of those questions around structure and just really breaking down how this is different from, you know, what you would go and buy on the stock market was a big, big area of questions for us just because it, it was private. So that's a whole different beast. Yeah. You know, part of why I asked that question was because it takes a lot of patience to be in investor relations, because often you are the same questions over and over again. And I think that's what makes the difference between good people in investor relations and great people, because the great people, it's as if every conversation they have is the first time they've ever answered that question. Mm -hmm. They give as much care and attention to detail to every single investor, even if it's the 10th time they've answered that same question in that day. And they're like, no, I'm focused on this person and my connection with this person who's in front of me right now. And as you said, I know that this is their life savings. I know this is really important to them. I'm going to give them every ounce of my attention. And that's why I, I love that you got into all that detail because I can tell you've answered those questions <laughs> a lot, a lot of times. Um, but I bet if somebody asked you that question right now, you'd give them as much care and compassion as you did all the hundreds of times you've answered those same questions before. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also, it would give me a moment to say, okay, am I not communicating this effectively? And it was more so like when they would come back, let me think about what I can do, but that just helps me further understand the product better, how I'm able to understand our investors better and what we can do around messaging to ensure that people are getting the answers they need and they don't have to come to me because that's huge. You know, you want to be able to ensure that you are messaging and connecting with people in the way in which they need to. So that way they don't have to ask those follow-up questions. But if they do, like you said, I'm here. But it was great feedback loop. You know, you're able to kind of really jump in and say, okay, we we need to change something here, or maybe we should do an event around this. And that just gives you that much more connection to your community. And the more you're able to have that patience and connect with them and understand their stories, the more trust they have in you, the more they tell other people about your brand, the more they want to invest more with you. So it's just a symbiotic relationship there. And it should be treated as such because it's less of a funnel and more of a flywheel where you kind of keep things going, the more you're able to kind of put in to that foundation up front. And if you're looking to impact a lot of people, you're going to answer the same questions over and over again. If you are only willing to say, I'm going to help a small group of people really change their lives, um, then you'd answer a small number of questions. But if that's your goal and you understand the value and the results of what this piece of information can have on someone's life, then it's almost like exciting to be asked that question again and again. I can hear that in your voice. Yeah. And it's, it's hard. It's hard, right? Because you have to have a breadth and depth of information and that takes time. And it also takes you really 
getting into the nitty gritty, pulling back the cap, asking the difficult questions, maybe getting things explained to you two, three times until you have it down. So you're able to take that back and distill it. So it does take a lot. So to all of my IR people out there, I see you and I know how difficult it is, but it is a, it's a job that unless you're in this type of investing, people don't really know the title. You know, I'm, I'm often explaining, oh, this is what I do. You know, it's not just answering phones. There's a lot more to that. It's not just customer service. It is a, it's quantitative and qualitative. It touches almost everything. And, and that's what's difficult, but that's again, to your point, what makes it fun. That's what keeps things fresh and what keeps me on my toes, at least. <laughs> Speaking of which, and this will be my last question before we move into the Life and Money Show spotlight round, but with your background and your experience and just the amazing person that you are, you could have had the pick of the litter of all these different firms and brands to work with. Why Good Egg? What drew you to this brand and our little team here? Oh, man. Where to start, right? <laughs> there is a genuine warmth here. And I and I've said this like before, there's a warmth here with everyone on the team and just the brand itself that is unlike anything that I've experienced, especially in this world. I've also spent most of my career with the institutions, family offices, high net worth. But being a person, you know, that is one of the first in my family, it was important for me to connect with the community and educate and bridge that gap to the millions of us that didn't have that education growing up or whose parents weren't taught that. So Good Egg was so unique in that you were really tapping into a market that is historically underserved and neglected. And I thought that was incredible. And how can I not want to be a part of that, especially with such an amazing team and how open and honest people are and just the constant drive to ensure we are not forgetting how we started, who our um, core group of people are and our mission to, I can say our now, our mission to educate and ensure that we are helping other families and other people who are just like us create that generational wealth and get to that place of freedom. Oh, such a breath of fresh air. I love it. I'm so glad. I mean, we're just so lucky to have you on the team and so lucky to have you representing the brand to the investors and to continue to foster and build these relationships in this community. And so much of what you've just said is what Julie and I talked about in the very first conversation that we had all those years ago before we launched the company and a lot of the things that we're passionate about and remain passionate about to this day. So, so grateful for you. Glad to have you on the team. Excited to see what you're going to do. But for now, we're going to move into our life and money show spotlight round. We're going to ask you three questions. We ask all our guests. Ariel, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. The first question is about your life and money. So share with us one thing that you're doing to live a meaningful and intentional life by design. Mm, I'm really learning how to prioritize myself and really kind of take the time to rest, not feel like I have to constantly be on and solve every problem to serve everyone all the time. Because if I don't feed myself, if I don't take care of myself, then I can't be the best person that I need to be for everyone else as well. So that's kind of how I've validated it in my mind in terms of really looking at self-prioritization as self-love instead of selfishness or something like that. Mm. Are you in my head right now? Absolutely. <laughs> like that's so yeah. much of <laughs> Same here. <laughs> it's a journey, right? It's a journey. It's a constant journey to figure out what does that look like now versus I used to be get up every morning, do morning yoga, these types of things. I want to get back to that. But I'm like, my schedule is different. But that doesn't mean I can't work it in somewhere else. That doesn't mean I can't find what feeds me now at this age versus when I was younger. So it's, it's a constant journey, you know? <laughs> yeah. Can I tell you one thing that reminds me of, and this is a total tangent, <laughs> but I get up every morning and I do my workout and some mornings I'm like, oh God, just snooze, snooze, snooze. And you know, lately... <laughs> The last like week or two, I've been obsessed with this fantasy book series. I, it's actually, I've read like, 
I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands of books in my lifetime. And I've never read a single book twice mm. until these books. As soon as there's two books in the series, it's the fourth wing series, dragons, romance, totally mm. not my normal thing, but I'm so obsessed with it. I can't even tell you why, but I read them both. They're like huge books, fourth wing and then iron flame. And then I immediately went back and started listening to the audio book versions. <laughs> and so in the mornings, when my alarm clock goes off, I lie there and my first thought is grumble, grumble, grumble. My <laughs> second thought is, wait, if I get up and do my workout, I can listen to the book while I'm working out. And that gets me out of bed. Can you believe it? But whatever it takes, you know, <laughs> that's the ultimate life hack. That's the ultimate life hack. It's like, right? if I get up, I can listen a little bit more. That's great. Oh, I need to stay. I know. How nerdy <laughs> am I? If I can get up, I can listen to more of my book. About <laughs> dragons and romance. <laughs> Whatever gets you out of bed to get that workout in, though, hey, is Don't knock the book until you've read it. You should try it. Fourth it's on way, my list. You, yeah. get into okay. it, you, you won't be able to put it down. It's really good. You, I've even had my kids listening to it, even though... <laughs> got like swear words in it, but they love it. It's totally, it's an epic story. I'm sorry. I spent so much time talking about fourth wing for any fourth wing. If you're listening to this and you're a fourth wing fan, you can reach out to me anytime. Anyway, sorry. Next Same question. <laughs> Book club, good egg book club. There we go. Right? That's right. We can talk about dragons and investing. Ah. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay. Next question is around others' life and money. So share with us one life or money hack, a tip, a resource, a book, anything you've found to be really helpful on your journey that you think might help someone else as well. Oh, I love this one. Okay. A tip. One of the early on me kind of learning about finances and kind of how to really break into building wealth is when someone said, look at assets that are obviously income producing. But if you're getting one that's just like 50 bucks a month, that could be your light bill. So start tying those small assets to one bill and then you've started cash flowing enough to kind of take care of your living expenses. And so when you start looking at it in bite-sized pieces, instead of trying to think about, oh, I want to invest all of this and hit it big so then I can retire. But when you break that down into, I'm going to tie my grocery bill for the week to this dividend that's paying out maybe 150 bucks. You know, it's not a whole lot, but it starts the journey on really freeing up your working capital and really letting your money work for you into a place where then you look up and everything is taken care of. So I love that. And that's something that I tell people like my younger cousins and those that are early trying to figure out how to start navigating this journey, that that should be the goal, not just the big goal of, you know, I'm going to hit it big and then retire because everyone wants to work towards that. But the steps to get there look different and it can be much easier than we think it is. And having those tangible things to tie it to, that's what's going to carry you through. That's going to give you that sense of progress. And okay, now I've added this one. Now I've, it's brick by brick by brick. And that journey, that diligence, that's what separates the wealthy from everybody else. Yeah. It's not that they've struck it rich with one sudden thing. I mean, lottery winners most of the time lose it all again and spend it all again very quickly, right? But the people who are truly wealthy, they've built it brick by brick by brick and they've had that patience and diligence. So that's a really good hack. All right. Finally, what about life and money in the world? So what's one thing that you're doing to help make the world a better place, whatever that means to you? Mm. So prior to joining Good Egg, I was at a firm that focused on workforce and affordable housing. And that was kind of my first step into, I say, using my evil powers for good, <laughs> was kind of getting involved in understanding just the depth and breadth of affordable housing and affordable housing in the U.S. and, and how much it's needed and how it impacts so many different people. So with that, I have connected with the community. I'm here in the Kansas City area and I joined the, I sit on the board of the Greater Kansas City Coalition to End Homelessness, a very long name we were talking about shortening, but it was great because it allowed me to really tap into my community and see what's going on. How can I be of service? How can I use this knowledge or this experience to be able to 
actually make change in my backyard. So that's not only grown my network and my understanding, but it's really helped me kind of carve out a path for me just locally to be able to be a resource and for someone to come and speak to folks, which, you, as you know, just kind of furthers the dream, the passion, and also your own knowledge in terms of what people are looking for, what's important to them. Why is this important to me and why should it be important to you? So yeah, that's probably one of my favorite things right now is, is really trying to understand the different ways in which you can have impact. And I would say all the time, you don't have to sacrifice returns for impact. You can have both. You know, you can do both. It just takes a little bit of intention and a little bit more research. Yeah. And how great that you're able to have an impact right in your backyard and to impact your local community. I mean, it it reminds me actually of recently I was on a trip to Singapore and I noticed that there was not a homeless population anywhere that we went Mm -hmm. in Singapore. And I was like, how is this possible? This city with very, very expensive real estate, how are they able to not have a homeless population? And I talked to a local about that and they were like, yeah, they just clean it up and they have all these government programs. They really cleaned it up back many decades ago, but it's a very hairy problem. There's a lot of different pieces to it. They, because Singapore is so small, they were able to come together and kind of create a solution that works for them. But yeah, I love that you're devoting your time, your energy and your effort towards something that will make an immediate impact in your local community. All right, Ariel. Well, final question is if people want to get in touch with you or learn more about all that we're doing now that you're part of the illustrious Good Egg team, what's the best place that people can go? They can join the Good Egg Investor Club and that's at goodegginvestments.com slash invest. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure the listener's going to want to connect with you and to learn more to get a chance to ask their questions. So Ariel, thank you so much for being here with us and the listener today. We're so grateful for you. Excited to see what you do on the Good Egg team. Thank you so much. It was wonderful talking to you, Susan and Annie. This was great. And I'm so excited to be here and excited to connect with all of our listeners. Mm -hmm. 